Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Mary's United Methodist Church. It is good to have you here with us. Um, we are in the season of Eastertide. Easter doesn't end the Monday after Easter Sunday. Eastertide actually runs for 40 days from Easter until Ascension Sunday, the Sunday uh, that we celebrate Jesus' Ascension back into heaven. And then 10 days later is Pentecost. And those aren't random numbers, they are numbers taken from the biblical story. So we are in the season of Easter time, and we continue to celebrate um, the Easter story, the Easter message. Um, this morning we're going to hear a story about one of Jesus' appearances to the disciples following the resurrection. Here are these words of greeting. If we are the disciples locked in a room of fear, Jesus appears to us. If we are Thomas, full of doubt, Jesus turns to us. If we bear trials and suffering, Jesus comes to us in power. If we rejoice, we do so in the presence of Christ. So let us come, whoever we are, to the God of hope and life. Let us pray. Stand among us once again, risen Lord. And bless us with your greeting. Peace be with you. Stand among us once again, exalted brother, and breathe upon us your promised spirit. Stand among us once again, you who have escaped death, and give us new birth into your living hope. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning is um, the lectionary text, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in his last time. In this you rejoice, even if for now, for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire, your faith, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We join now in the time of sharing our joys and concerns. Let me share a few with you, and then I'll give you time to lift yours up wherever you are worshiping from. <coughs> we give thanks today for the life of Dottie White. We remember that through Christ's death and resurrection, her life in him will never end. We pray for Johnny Vinegar. We pray for Care Haven and the Heritage and those vulnerable populations especially as they are being tested this week and in the weeks to come for COVID-19, knowing some of them won't understand what's happening. We pray for healthcare workers, nursing care facility workers, the folks who work in essential businesses and their families they return to home daily. We pray for our children and our teenagers, especially the graduating class of 2020, who won't be returning to school this year. While we know it's not the end of the world, to many of them it certainly feels like it is at the moment. We pray for our leaders. May they be wise in their counsel and willing to listen to the experts who are advising them. And now I give you a few moments to lift up your prayers and your joys.
Let us pray. Risen Lord, we know that if we are the disciples locked in a room of fear, you appear to us. Risen Lord, if we are Thomas full of doubt, you turn to us. Risen Lord, if we bear, bear, bear trials and suffering, you come to us in power. Risen Lord, if we rejoice, we do so in your presence. So let us come, whoever we are, to the God of hope and life. Now we join our voices together in praying the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are blessed this morning to have a uh, quartet from our choir here to share special music with us, and of course accompanying them and playing both the piano and organ for us today is Barbara Maston. So I invite them to come forward at this time. called the twin, 
one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hand, and put my fingers in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You are the potter and we are your clay. Amen. John Stuart Bill Mill once said, There are many truths of which the full meaning cannot be realized until personal experience has brought it home. My first year at Duke Divinity School, I arrived early to be part of a mission team that was made up of students and faculty. Several of us students went out to dinner one evening, and we ended up in an establishment that was frequented by Duke undergrad students. One of my new classmates, was just explaining the details of the Duke basketball lineup for that year. And as he's telling us this, Christian Leitner walks by. Now one of the guys at the table recognized him, called him over, and the very person at the table who had been waxing enthusiastically about the lineup for the basketball season was speechless. Finally, he stammered, man, you play basketball so good. It was hysterical, and the memory of it still makes me chuckle. Now, a few of you hearing this story will see the humor in it, and some of you are scratching your heads and wondering who Christian Leitner is. But most of you are perplexed about why this was such a big deal. I guess you had to be there. Have you ever been in a situation like that? You tell the story, but it just falls flat. It was relevant to you, but maybe not to others who hadn't experienced it. Think about the last time you were telling somebody about a movie you loved. You're trying to tell them why it's so compelling without giving the plot twists away. And in the end, you finally say something like, you just have to go see it for yourself. It happens with best-selling books. Sometimes the hype just makes us hesitant and doubtful about actually reading it. Perhaps we feel that we'll be let down when we find the reality of the book to be less interesting than the publicity had led us to believe. The truth is, some things just don't lend themselves well to a third-person account. Sometimes we can be persuaded, but at other times we have to experience it for ourselves. There is a constant yearning in most people for powerful experiences. Let me tell you a story from my childhood. When I was about seven years old, Mom and I were in the car. This was back in the days where kids could ride in the front seat. So I was in the front seat, and I was checking out the cigarette lighter. This is in the days where cars had cigarette lighters. <laughs> and, and I asked my mom how it worked, and she explained that she pushed, pushed it in, and it got real hot, and you used it to light a cigarette. And I said, well, how hot does it get? And she said, very, very hot. Hot enough that it would burn you. And I said, well, well, how much would it burn me? And she said, it would burn you a lot. And I said, well, I want to try it. I want to push it in and get it hot and put my finger on it. And my mother 
calling out my middle name, which means I'm, she's exasperated with me, said, Claire Juliet, do not do that. You are going to burn your finger, it's going to hurt, and you are going to cry. And I said, well, I just, I just, I just want to try it. I just want to try it. And so she and I went back and forth several times, and finally, in exasperation, she said, okay, give it a try. So I plugged it in. I pulled it out. It was red hot. I put my thumb in it. I burnt it. It hurt. I cried. But for whatever reason, mainly because I was a stubborn kid, I had to experience it for myself. There's a constant yearning in most of us for powerful experiences. Just look at the current TV schedule. It's packed full of reality shows designed to be gripping. Programs like 60 Minutes and Cops and Rescue 911 and Extreme Home Makeover. Those are so common these days. Thousands pack concerts that pummel the senses. We pay big bucks to be moved. Being entertained isn't enough. We have to be touched in some magical way that leaves an impact on us that we won't forget. We want to be carried away by the crowd, lost in the music, shocked by the violence, graphic language, or behavior. We crave salsa that makes us sweat speed that is breathtaking, and humor that makes us laugh until we cry. Virtual reality technology can be as addictive as any narcotic, and it's not hard to see why. For most kids, the thrill of a video game holds far more, more appeal than a book does. The stimulation, the impact, is so much easier to achieve the player is plugged immediately into graphic and intense action. The impact is even greater when it's shared with others. Only a player can understand another player's excitement. And if one of the group doesn't have the newest version of the game, it creates an instant barrier between how they play together. Sports fans are another example of the need for instant and intense excitement. Can you just see a bunch of 20-something guys sitting around talking and suddenly into the room walks LeBron James or some other sports mega hero? That would be pretty intense for them. But now try to imagine them trying to explain the incident later to a buddy who wasn't there. Man, I'm telling you, he was really here. He sat right here at the table with us and drank a beer. It was totally awesome. What do you mean you don't believe us? Well, yeah, we forgot to get a selfie, but we saw it with our own eyes. It's not too hard then to visualize some doubt on the part of a modern day Thomas. Some things just need to be experienced to be believed. Perhaps it wasn't that Thomas doubted his friend's honesty or doubted the power that Jesus had, but Thomas just wasn't there. John's Gospel reads, but Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. What a tragedy that absence was. A life-shaping moment happened, and Thomas wasn't there to experience it with the tight-knit band of which he was a part. Thomas hadn't been there to see Jesus, to hear his words, see his wounds, or inhale the breath of his peace. In his book, A Community of Character, Stanley Hallowoss, a professor of mine at Duke, uses an example of the power of a shared experience. He points to the development of a community of rabbits in Richard Adams' book, Water Shipped Down. Hauerwas says, 
what we see is not power or security or equality or even dignity, but a sense of worth gained from participating and contributing to a common sense of adventure. He continues, indeed, our dignity derives exactly from our sense of having played a part in such a story. In the story of Watership Down, it's the shared adventures of rabbits which create the bond of community. In the Christian story, it's the experience of being with Jesus that draws his followers together. Thomas, by his absence, has missed a part of the adventure. And Thomas, no doubt, pardon the pun, felt distant from his community because something incredible had happened which the others had experienced, and he had not. Now, we don't know why Thomas wasn't there. Perhaps he had a great reason. Perhaps it was a day when he just wanted to be alone. Perhaps he was tired of sheltering in place. But whatever the reason, Thomas was absent from the band of Jesus' followers. He just wasn't there. We, like the gathered followers of the crucified and newly risen Christ, are a community based on shared participation in the greatest of adventures. Week by week, Christ comes and stands among us, even, and maybe especially, when we can't join together physically. Wherever, however we gather, Christ is there. And imagine what it'll be like when we get to gather together physically again. Oh, the stories we will tell. Stories of funny things that happened. Stories of things that broke our hearts. Stories of how we managed to get by and to get through. Stories of the adventures we have had. We will bind up each other's wounds and lift up each other's hearts, and we'll do it together. In Acts, we read about 120 people who experienced the power of the Holy Spirit together. They shared the story of this encounter with excitement and brought 3,000 more people into the community who also wanted to share in that excitement. If we expect others to believe us about the risen Lord, to eagerly join us on this adventure, we have to find ways to help them experience the presence of God in our midst. Believe it or not, this is a great time to do that. People are longing and yearning for something of significance in their lives. Maybe you need to invite others to join our services on Facebook or YouTube. Maybe you need to share a devotion with them. Maybe you need to offer to pray with them. And when it's time to return to the sanctuary, I hope you'll invite them. Our worship and fellowship needs to be open to others in order to experience the full power of God in our community. Think about it. Your excitement when we describe what it means to be part of the body of Christ should at least, at least equal the excitement we tell after seeing a really good media event or a sporting event. God in Christ has created a community that allows us to define our very lives around our having come to know the risen Christ. What an experience. What an adventure. You just have to be there and be a part of it. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now I invite you to hear these words of benediction and blessing. In great mercy, God has given us a new birth into a living hope. 
For it is the risen Christ who stands in our midst and says, Peace be with you. We go from this time of worship to walk the path of new life and living hope. And may the peace of the risen Christ be with us today and every day. Amen.